Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Yeah. Welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast. We in out chat. Bitcoins, we got them. Acquire, never sell. But catch us rolling deep like a Dell. Bitcoin, blockchains, cryptocurrency. Three guys faded talking Bitcoin, no fee. That's the free Bitcoin podcast, insane. And adoption is still the only thing, thing, thing that matters, man. Hey everybody, welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast episode 214, coming to you live and in HD, live. I'm your first host, Marcello. And I'm host number two, Dimitric. And I am host number three, Dr. Corey Petty. Hey yo. What kind of cup is that? What's up, fellas? I feel like you just kind of, it's like, is that a disposable cup? Yeah, this is what I drink my coffee out of. Why don't you use regular cups? You're in your apartment. Well, what if I have to, what if I have to go somewhere? What if I'm on the go? Then you could use that. But how often are you on the go in the morning? Especially like when you're doing a podcast. Corey, <laughs> being on the go is a mind frame, my friend. It's not necessarily 100 percent physical. So you just you just make sure that all the peripherals are like reinforcing your mind frame. Yes, exactly. Just okay. in case I'm on the go. Okay. I drink coffee like I'm oh. on the go. Okay. <laughs> like I'm on the go. <laughs> I know what you're saying. It's a terrible waste of paper because I like how Corey Corey just took a drink in frame just to prove his point. Yeah, yeah. It's my, it's my <laughs> non to go cup. Should be drinking out of. Yeah, very subtle. Um, hey, well, I had a I had a bidet thought, guys, and you're gonna think that it's ridiculous, but if you think about it, it might be interesting. So, um, <laughs> just this one of a bidet thought. Yeah. So. Um, do you like Guardians of the Galaxy movies? I'm a fan, yeah. Yeah, so the director of those films has been fired. Yeah, for some stupid shit he said, like child porn and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, 10 years ago. So I was thinking, like, what if someone like Brian Armstrong said, or maybe he did like a Papa John where he said the N-word during a conference call, or he sent a bad tweet 10 years ago and got pushed out of his company. What would that mean for this space? If someone who's in a prominent role in the space did something, had a lapse of judgment and did something dumb, and they weren't able to continue to be a pioneer in the space, like that, that could be real. There's so many. I don't know. know. Vitalik said something pretty terrible last year, and he's given a pass on it. So what did he say last year? Um, he he said that like drug dealing arguably does more physical harm than child pornography because like child pornographers just sit at home on their desktops and don't do anything to a person and i was like oh it's a pretty bad tweet it's pretty public but it's almost then, like you shouldn't you shouldn't even give your thoughts on anything other than ethereum when you're in, the, in that position of power like don't give um, us your commentary on politics or drugs or so nothing. just don't be a human whenever you get put into power just don't be a it's, human it's you're almost, not supposed to be human you're supposed to be everybody's human and mm, that makes me mm, i disagree well, that's the way it works, man. That's why politicians go kooky because they spend so much time trying to be everybody, and then they go, then they become nobody. It's deep. Well, they become. Well, a what would we do though man. if, like, a, a prominent developer like said something, and then they, and then oh well, because isn't there like just a handful of people that can like uh, improve sharding or improve the Lightning Network? You know what I mean? Like, what happens? Mm -hmm. What happens if like Elizabeth Stark said something eight years ago, and oh well, now we don't have our expertise in the space anymore. Somebody would take her place. There's one thing I know in life, and that's everybody can be replaced. That's a that's a dark thing to know in life. No, I mean that's true. Like it doesn't matter. Somebody would take her. Somebody would take her spot. Somebody would be the new Elizabeth Stark. But I'm, well, I mean, someone's going to direct Guardians of the Galaxy three, but arguably it's going to be different in tone than the first two, and maybe in quality. True. Well. Maybe they should get what's his name on the hotline and not tell anybody and just make it just like the first two so it's say successful. 
I see what you're saying, though. Like, I mean, I, I guarantee you, it's like, say, you know, something happened to Vitalik and he lost all of his, I guess, credentials somehow or some forth or was shunned from the community. You could be damn sure Ethereum and all of its coins would drop in price because even though he has no, like, technical control over Ethereum, he has a lot of social control over Ethereum and people idolize him. Yeah, so let, let's say that, that tweet that Vitalik said last year. Let's just say Ethereum, the community isn't to where uh, somebody could report that tweet and he can get fired. But when this becomes super mainstream, like eight years from now, what if someone dug up that tweet and then, you know, I don't That's know. So it's, dumb, I was though, thinking about that. Digging it's, up it's tweets. Retarded. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't. I like. I would like. I don't mind if people are human and they do human things, which is like fallible and make mistakes. It's them trying to like hide the fact or deny it after they've done it if they own up to it and be like yeah sorry i learned from it it was a mistake then cool we can move on but if people consistently basically just say that didn't happen despite irrefutable evidence that it happened or they try and save face or pretend like it wasn't that big of a deal then you can maybe treat them accordingly but like man everybody's weird let them be yeah. weird um that was I'm trying to find the tweet. tweet. I'm trying to find the tweet. So, but it's, it's oh, somebody who's better with the internet could probably find it. But Vitalik did. My keyboard is, is way Trump too loud Trump. to be typing. Oh, you can hear all the typing stuff. Would you like me to type something just so you can hear it? It's a mechanical keyboard. My my, my keyboard mine's not mechanical. There you go. What's wrong with my mouth? My keyboard's not mechanical. But anyways. Um, is there anything that you guys want to talk about specifically today? What's on the docket? Yeah, I got something to talk about. What you got, fam? The 40, oh, yeah. under 40, man. How uh, Fortune Magazine put Brian Armstrong in the top 20 and mm -hmm. sandwiched Rihanna up in there between him and Vitalik. That's pretty big. Are you, <laughs> are you guys familiar? So Rihanna, I'm familiar with Rihanna. Rihanna is on par with Armstrong and Vitalik. All right. Ella. Ella. E. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with Rihanna. Uh, I'm familiar with Brian Armstrong as well and Vitalik. I know all three of those names, sir. I'm hip. I mean, are you familiar with, with the article that came out? No. I, I saw not, the article. I didn't read it. <laughs> I know what 40 under 40 means. It's like, these are the people that will be more successful than you've ever been in your life. And they're not even 40 years old yet. That's pretty much what it is in a nutshell. Yeah. So, I, you know, the, <laughs> it's going to get me. Yeah. It's going to get millions and millions and millions of views. And people are going to be like, Coinbase. Oh, Rihanna, yeah ethereum so i think people will see these people and the projects they're attached to and it'll bring some more awareness i mean yeah i probably will i think mass adoption is a matter of urge though and a matter of like want um it's just a matter of want like if you want the information you'll seek it out if you don't then you won't and well, i think Corey's world is the most re real world where most of these gpps these general purpose ass people, <laughs> they're not going to know they're using crypto. It's just going to be something that makes their life better without them knowing. And that's just the way it's going to be. The yous and the uses and the people that listen to our show and the people that subscribe to the information we put out there, plus the people that are going out and getting their own, plus people making their own. These are the people that are going to be the plumbers of the future. These are the people that you call because they have the expertise. And then you're going to pay a premium on your ignorance for being a GPP for these people to help you out. So you think it'll be a passive re revolution here where people are just they're going to be using the technology whether they want to or not in the future. No, they won't that will that part won't be a revolution. Um those people will probably be using something that is I don't want to say derivative but built to top. Like for instance, uh this guy who opened up he he increased the capacity of the Lightning network by 214% or something like that. Um in dramatically increasing the probability that um, transactions are routed through one of his 16 channels route, right? So what happens when we get some legs behind what he's done and some data and he makes a good about a good bit of revenue, then you might see places like Coinbase open up these giant nodes or, you know, other centralized, centralized places open up these giant nodes. So to, to, to help the functionality of that network. So the GPPs get all the benefits, but not know what's happening in the background right so 
I got a few things. Yeah. Um, for the most part, I think that's the way that it's going to go, ex- at least in countries like, that we live in, like first world countries. We don't we don't need the, the you can't say that. That's offensive. No, I don't give a shit. It's fine. <laughs> uh, Zero world. They don't like people who need the infrastructure that don't have banking services need what these technologies can offer right now. People who don't need banking infrastructure don't need any of this stuff. And so they're kind of waiting for the applications to show up that make their lives better, like you were just talking about. And that's when they're going to get exposure to this whole world. Um, Yeah. Something else I wanted to say there that I already forgot about because I was thinking about that statement. Do you think Rihanna is going to be like, who's this bald headed motherfucker in front of me? And then she learns all about his company so she can be like number 19 next year. No, Rihanna doesn't even know she's in the damn article. Probably. No, I, don't, I think, oh. I think that might be an article where she might pay attention to. I don't know because it, what is she in there for her makeup? Yeah. She's in there for the lingerie line and the cosmetic stuff. Uh, you know, she's not in there because she's releasing records, you know? So as a business owner, like Jessica Alba, you know, I think she's not in there. She's not on the list, but I'm saying if she was on there, or maybe she is, I don't know. Uh, it wouldn't be because she's an actress, but because of like the other endeavors. And I think they pay attention to those things. Yeah. Rihanna's makeup supposedly is great for black women. According to uh, all of the thousands of ads I see <laughs> for it when I'm scrolling through Instagram. What I was going to say um, outside of that. Yeah. I remember now. I get ads for black women. That um, I read an article <clears throat> from a guy who increased the Lightning Network tremendously he put yep. like on like 13 bitcoin or something on it mm-hmm. forget how much 15, it actually yeah so like, well he said that like um no he says he, he's releasing a series of articles on like how to do it and then like how to set it up how to run it how to then monitor it and so far based on his experience having that many channels open which is a good portion of the entire lightning network he hasn't made enough to even cover the server costs of running the lightning network node so yeah like it's not People aren't running Lightning Network nodes because they're making a bunch of money. And as the network grows and more and more people do that, they're going to make less money because the routing optimizes for not only shortest path, but also smallest fee. And so you don't make a lot of money doing this. You make a little bit, but it's probably not going to be enough to um, offset the cost of the server it takes to run all of it. Mm Mm-hmm. And that was the pipe dream, right? Yeah. I mean, I, it's just, it a, it's just, it just increases the number of pieces of software you need to run to interact with Bitcoin if you want to use a lightning yeah. network. And this, uh, this is also like a, um, it can be a precursor to proof of stake systems too, because it, it's, it's like watered down proof of stake, right? You're staking your Bitcoin yeah. Yeah. in order to add benefits to, to do off chain stuff, to do off chain stuff, period. So, um, that's what most, we'll that's what most of the layer two solutions are. You stake whatever the native asset is, whether it be Ethereum or Bitcoin or Litecoin, mm-hmm. because Litecoin does this too. And th- that gives you, that's supposed supposedly gives you incentives to act properly to do off chain stuff. And when you're done with all mm-hmm. that off chain stuff, whatever it may be, you then settle back on the blockchain with whoever you would, with whoever you dealt with. Yeah. So it's like saying, I'm going to set this money aside. And if I, if I can provably act badly, you can take some of that money away or all of it, depending on whatever the protocol is. And so once I do that, I'm going to do a bunch of off-chain stuff, presumably correctly, because I have money set aside. And then mm-hmm. we're all doing, done doing that. Everyone settles back on the blockchain. And you go about your merry way. That's the gist of all off-chain solutions. Yeah. And that's also based upon the the precedent that nobody wants to see your fucking cup of coffee on the blockchain. Nobody cares. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you don't, you don't need, you know, universal immutability for all time to prove that you bought a donut. Nope. Or in my case, Flaming Hot Cheetos or X, X double extra hot Flaming Hot Cheetos. This which is a, are, that's a thing? Yeah. Yeah, it's a thing. It's actually just regular flavor Hot Cheetos from the 90s, and they've taken less of the hot dust and put it on the regular flavor. So that's what you do as a business. Hold Instead on. of like putting on more dust. I haven't dust, seen these. Where do, you, where do you buy these? 
they're black label. Just go to the store and look at the black label Cheetos, and it's double extra hot. It might only be and a southern thing. They just thing. taste like the Cheetos from when we were kids. No, it's a thing. All but right. maybe it's not up north yet, but it's they're, definitely down here. I think they're next to the Sprite that Drake does commercials for. <laughs> That's right. It's got my face on it because they know who that is. That whole rapper to. thing did not last long. Like celebrity, the thing. like that, like we're getting endorsements from from rappers and celebrities. That didn't last very long. I guess the ICO boom is kind of over because we're not seeing like Ti come in and be like, "Yo, yo, yo, ICO." Oh yeah, that's because like when one person gets sued, the rappers tend to stop doing that. That shit got shut like, down. Yeah, Mayweather's getting sued. Uh, Steven Seagal was just threatened with being sued, and I think he flew. What did he do? The, like he, I got threatened to be sued. For being it's the goal was endorsing Bitcoin.com with two eyes instead of one. So it was Bitcoin, C O I I N. No now way. Now Steven Seagal's token. Yes, yes way. This happened last year. Oh, he's a weirdo. What, what did yeah. you? You said you got sued, Cello. You got threatened. Yeah, I got threatened to be sued. For what? I, or I, I was advising a uh, ICO last year that ended up not being legit, so I removed myself from it. And then some uh, angry guy who said that he invested too much money was going to sue me. And I was oh. just like, no, no, you're not. You advised them to stop being so ghetto and then left? I, I just I just removed myself once I, I found out that it wasn't as legitimate as I thought. And uh, not my fault. I mean, 97% of these companies start out legitimate and then you find they have ulterior motives. Yeah. So Ain't it the truth. But what, what we, while, you, while you say that, like, what we are starting to see, though, is some of these promises that were made are starting to come true. Augur. Yeah, I was just about to say that. Augur is going, and it looks like it's going very swimmingly. And the reason why I think Augur is, is baller is because I recently, not I, but something I'm associated with recently reached out for sponsorship. And their response was, we don't market, we just code. And I was like, I'm offended a little bit because of what I do. And I like sponsorships, but I respect I respect your swagger, Augur. That is very swagalicious. You yeah, I was uh, you just code. reading a couple of their their recent kind of announcements. They the first they, they don't really need to sponsor because well, maybe they do. I don't know. It depends on how how useful their platform becomes. But the mm -hmm. first round of settlements from the bets on Augur or prediction markets called bets and gambling, but uh. Was they settled around twenty thousand Ethereum for the first Ooh. round, and that's a that's Ooh. a that's a small amount of bets on the platform. It was just like no, the no, ones no. twenty thousand in Ethereum. No, twenty thousand ETH, I think. Twenty thousand ETH. Yeah, it was the first round of settlements from all the bets. And so, they, do you think that Tony Switch oh, wakes great. up in the morning and oh, just so screams good. in a pillow? I think he's doing okay. Tony he, I mean, he got he had nice. <laughs> oh no, he's. Tony Switch is doing fine. He's doing fine. You think he's not like, nah. Maybe. No. <laughs> Tony Switch is doing fine. All right. Uh, um, I think if you go on coin market cap, and I think one auger last time I looked was like 140 bucks. Give it whatever, whatever it is. I think any company who's like one token is worth more than 100, they're going to have incentive and motivation to actually see through to a product. Like Dash, they'll be okay, and uh, whatever else is high. They have too much money. They have too much yeah, they money. Have too much they money. gotta just keep. I mean, they're, they're kind of almost like will accidentally make a product because they just have so much money to keep working. It's just gonna probably be slow. <laughs> accidentally make a product. You know what I mean? Like if you just keep moving in the right direction, regardless of how slow it may be or how bad you are at it, you're gonna make something. Yeah, like That's uh, very true. like Zcash. I mean, you're almost at two hundred dollars a token. You're, there's probably gonna be something there. Yeah, well, Zcash, you don't need much more well, than a privacy. Lot. They're they're not. And they they're pushing zero knowledge cryptography. Yeah, I mean, you by, 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 not, they're not pushing it in terms in terms of trying to sell it. They're pushing the boundaries of how they work, and yep. a lot of the money that goes into Zcash is going into funding that that research into further furthering applied cryptography. That's why I like no it doubt. so much. No doubt, zero knowledge proofs are going to help a lot of things. Dash, is, Dash is, is pushing the research on how fast can you buy a Lamborghini and put a decal on it that says Dash on it. Yeah. Dash is a marketing ex uh, marketing experiment. Yeah. That's what it is. There's nothing yeah, really novel there. Yeah. What's, what's crazy is we almost had Stephen Baldwin on the show on behalf of Dash, and now he's 
Justin Bieber's father-in-law. Oh, what? How do you? Are you just like, you, it is bananas, but how do you know magazines that? magazines are you reading? Yeah. I, What's I, going on there? I mean, when the most popular 20-something gets engaged, it's kind of hard to, you, you just bat away the headlines, even if you don't want to read them. They're kind of oh, yeah. I did see him kissing on some lady on a lake, and I was like, oh, I guess Justin Bieber's being Justin Bieber. And then you got to give him some credit for being, um, having like a modicum of sanity at this point in his life. Yeah. I remember seeing his original videos on YouTube when he was a kid singing in the camera. Could you imagine being that popular as a kid? Um, I was in high school. Know what I'm saying? No, I'm just. But um, like, whenever we see like, oh, you know, Vitalik's gonna have a nervous break. Like, come on, man, he he doesn't have like one one thousandth of like a Justin Bieber stressful day. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but he's not also not like singing in front of adoring like w- girls who are who are passing out because he walked by them. Like, you think that's the stressful part? I don't know, man. Like, in order to perform, like, I guess you still have to like. <laughs> I think that's the part that's not stressful. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. it's like it's the it's the it's the demand to perform at all times and then to be like this person. You can't be a human, like we were talking about earlier. You're not allowed yeah. to be a human anymore. You have to be a superhuman. And people aren't fucking superheroes. Yeah. Yeah, I think Elon Musk is having a little Twitter like mental breakdown as of I don't I don't yeah. follow it too close, but people are saying he needs to like down. <laughs> he needs to put the Twitter down for a little bit. Yeah. He needs to just take he needs to go on vacation, like. He's trying too hard. He's a try hard. He's, he's been, trying way too he's hard. He's been a try hard his whole life. It's just, you don't try to change the world. You just do stuff. And hopefully the world agrees that what you did is awesome. He's he's setting out to change the world, which only ends terribly. Like, he just needs to relax. I don't he know. Just needs like to- even, if, even if you just stop now, I'd say he's made significant progress towards changing the world in the right direction. Yeah. That's very true. He needs to, he needs to stop. He needs to pull a what's the name like when people it go out on a victory, like end with a cha- like Wayne Gretzky, right? Didn't he end with a championship? He was like, "Hey, I'm out. I'm I won. I'm out. No, do it so you crash and burn. <laughs> Live long enough to be the villain. Yeah, that's everybody's story. <laughs> like the only person who's ever successfully done that, I think, is Floyd Mayweather. Everybody else, they they get L's, L's, L's until they retire, and they're like, "Damn it." Yeah, he bought into the. To the villain. He's a heel. Yeah, uh, he's a heel by nature. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Well, uh, let's go on ahead and push the interview out so we could get to the second half of this round table. Corey, were you gonna say something? I interrupted you. Your mouth was like open while I started talking. You did exactly what I was gonna do. Good job. Okay. Uh so we got an interview here. From Dan uh Bonet, uh Dr. <laughs> Dan Bonet. Cello, you were just waiting for me to. No, that was a pause. That was a little pause in between. <laughs> Dan, Dan Bonet, uh, he um, is a professor. He's, he's been studying, uh, not studying, uh, lecturing, and being a straight up bouse in the the discipline of cryptography for some time. And um, he, like the rest of us that are so infatuated with this space, uh, caught word of cryptocurrency, and the rest is history. And now he is the director of. Uh, the Blockchain Research Institute uh, at Stanford. And if you don't know what Stanford is, get cultured uh, because it's a big fucking deal. Um, it's a university over out on the West Coast. I believe it's a private university too. I've actually been on that campus and it is bananas how much money flows into that school. But um, yeah, uh, we, we had him on to talk about his research. We had him on to talk about the Institute. Um, he's been biddle is it build, biddle or biddle? I don't know what biddle. that word is. Build, but with the D, they switch the D. There's two oh, camps on that. Yes, I think whatever. it's biddle. Go ahead. Anyways, we're that's we should stop doing those dumb things. But anyways, he's a builder, and uh, yeah, Corey and I sat down and we had a cup of coffee and uh, a bagel and chatted with him in a coffee shop. Does he own crypto? Do people do people that uh, like study security and talk about cybersecurity and the future of cryptography? Do they own any? You think? I you'd imagine so. I but hope now so. It's to a point where I hope so. Not. If they're that deep in, they know where this is going, and they probably own something. Something. Yeah. Well, because I know. I mean, there's two people attached to this network that don't have any, and they're 
they're evangelists and advocates. Yeah, but they do. Yeah. They just don't have like a tremendous amount relative to their net worth. Mm -hmm. They're not like everybody should own some bags, bags right? They just have some hashtag, and they hold on to it. Hashtag not investment advice. Buy some crypto. Uh, I I gave some as some investment advice when Coinbase added those tokens. I was like, you should buy those tokens. This is investment advice. <laughs> Straight up, there's like, no way around it. This, this is investment advice. Sue me if you want to. Come at me, dog. Uh, anyways, please don't sue us. Yeah, please don't. Yeah, Corey, I could see that. Like your, I could see the fear in your eyes when Shello just let it. I didn't know that he was threatened to be sued, but you were like, "What? <laughs> when did this happen?" <laughs> um. Anyways, uh, here's the interview with Dr. Dan Bonet. Um, but we hope you enjoy it. Here it is. Hello, hello. Today's interview, we are joined with Dr. Dan Bonet, uh, the director uh, at the uh, the Center for Blockchain Research out at Stanford. And so I thought it would be interesting to get Dr. Bonet on the show. Um, he's worked in cryptography pretty much. Like I, I looked a little bit into your background. I saw cryptography seems to be your main focus so naturally it, it's it's led you to to cryptocurrency and i kind of wanted to get you on the show so welcome welcome dr bonet yeah thanks everyone it's a great great to be here and uh love looking forward to chatting with you why don't we uh start off by allowing you to introduce yourself um and then kind of explain to us i guess your your road into this this community environment space and um what you're what you're currently interested in now and a kind of like a topical sure. way that we'll dive into specifics will do yeah so i'm a professor of computer science at stanford i've uh, been here over uh, 20 years um and i work on cryptography uh specifically i like um uh, this area of applied cryptography so uh crypto that can actually be used in the real world um as i said i've been doing it a long time it's a really really fun area to work in and when cryptocurrencies and blockchains came along, uh, you know, obviously they're big users of, of crypto. The, you know, this was a, a, a fantastic opportunity to see more applications of, of real world crypto in the real world. So I started, um, I, I got into the space and been doing it now for a couple of years. Um, and we have a bunch of results that I would love to discuss, uh, but also uh, as you mentioned, we started just recently. We started this uh, center for blockchain research at Stanford, which uh, be, I'd be happy to talk more about as well. But um, which order would you like to take to take these in? These in. I I would love to dive into the center for blockchain research first. Um, the reason why I piqued my interest is because I think that like most, um, I don't know, most. I guess we'll say something a little uh, like catchy, but most viral behavior or viral interest kind of bud on college campuses. And if cryptocurrency and blockchain technology are becoming to a point where they're like in demand for that college students want to study them and do research on them. Um, I would like to be like in the trenches per se. And I feel like getting you on the show would, would help us with that. And so what, what exactly happens at a center for blockchain research um, what does that mean for the students? So. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, well, we do blockchain research. So I can tell you uh, what happened here is um, I, I really like the, the, the blockchain space as a research area. Um, I have to say, I think it, uh, it suffers from a little bit of uh, over overhype. But if you fundamentally look at blockchains, um, there's a lot of scientific problems that need to be solved. And th that's what really attracts me to the space, the science, the core science problems that uh, blockchain, uh, blockchains ra raise. There are lots of questions that we simply wouldn't have asked if it wasn't for blockchains. And many of our papers in the area, I have to say, you know, we would not have written if it wasn't for the scientific questions that blockchains that come from blockchains. So what what attracted me to the space um, really is kind of the heart, the deep science that's uh, that's being raised here. And you know, just to be specific, um, as I said, there are like new questions in cryptography that that uh, are uh, being raised by blockchains. I guess we'll talk about those in just a minute. Um, 
there are questions about uh, programming languages, you know, what are the right languages for using, um, for programming smart contracts. We're doing work on that. There's questions on uh, verif new techniques for verification um, of consensus protocols, of smart contracts. Um, questions, questions around game theory that has to do, have to do with economics and such uh, of the blockchain. And of course, questions about uh, legal aspects, um, you know, spanning the whole gamut of, is it a security, is it a, com a commodity, um, and so on. So it's a, it's a really, really broad area of topics. All of those are being studied in this uh, center. So we have faculty kind of working in all these areas. Um, my, 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 as I said, my main area is applications of uh, cryptography, but you know, I'm fascinated with programming languages and how do we write, uh, how do we write these um, distributed applications in a way that are easy to reason about and easy to, um, to verify the resulting code. So we, we're doing a number of projects in that space. Um, so as I said, the kind of the center uh, brings all this activity together. Before the center, uh, the different faculty kind of were working independently of one another. Um, the center kind of uh, brings all this activity together. Uh, so there's tremendous excitement. We're really, um, uh, really, really uh, thrilled to be to to have launched this. Um, I think it's going to have a lot of impact on the ecosystem. Our goal is to develop technology that uh, the ecosystem can use. Um, I really love talking to projects uh, that deal with blockchains. Um, literally every project I talk to, I walk away with new research problems to think about. Even you know, just this morning I was talking to. Uh, a project, that, a new project that just started, and already I have three new research problems to think about. Um, you know, I have to say this is kind of rare that yeah. uh, that uh, you know the rate of ideas that are being generated um, is not something not so, not something that happens every day. And for us, this is a godsend because you know we're always looking for good problems to work on, and these new projects are phenomenal at, at generating uh, problems for us to think about. Um, so each one of these, you know, that leads to a, to a research paper that we write, and the hope is that the, the community adopts the, the, you know, the research that comes out of the center, um, and so that's our goal. We're basically a resource for the community, so if anyone is listening out there and they have an interesting blockchain project that has interesting technical problems um, that they would like to solve, please come talk to us, and we would be, we would be thrilled to help. I, I probably need to talk to you, uh, but anyway. I would love that. Yeah. I would love Do you that. have an interesting problem that could, could use some academic interest? Uh, I, I wanted to kind of Excellent. Excellent. move on That's to something. I don't want to move on to it, but I want to kind of ask this from a different perspective in that um, all of what you just said is incredibly multidisciplinary. And this is something that I experienced going through graduate school with computational chemistry. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to then bring in very disparate pieces of academic study into a single place and you end up kind of having siloed experts that rarely ever talk to each other that could solve each other's problems really quickly if they ever even knew that they needed to talk to each other and i feel like blockchain kind of has done that for all the di di disparate academic fields um, that are coming together can, to kind of solve these problems have you seen like almost a resurgence of interest in what would previously be um, I don't want to call it dull, but like less active areas of research now that block people are coming asking blockchain questions because they require the expertise of these certain types of things all together in one. Yeah. So what it's doing is bringing people together. Yeah. So being, bringing researchers uh, together to work in this in this area. The way we do that is through like very active outreach uh, programs. Uh, so, for example, we started a new blockchain seminar on campus. Um, and so, you know, there are people who come to the seminar from all over campus. Um, these are people who don't, as you say, don't normally, don't usually uh, speak to one another because they work in their own silos. Um, and this kind of brings them all together uh, to discuss to discuss these, these, these problems. We also have a number of courses on blockchains. Um, so our, uh, our course, our, our, our main course, uh, you know, blockchain technologies is called CS251. This is the third year we're, we'll be teaching this course. Um, it's kind of interesting that attendance in the course sort of um, mirrors the price of Bitcoin. So yeah, yeah, I'm, we get the I'm, same I'm thing. hoping that you know that as, as we head into the fall and we teach the course, I'm hoping there'll be a recovery so that we'll have we have um, you know a lot of a lot of students coming. Although I, I think the area is popular enough that there's no 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 uh, shortage of students who wanna who wanna participate in the space. Um, so yeah, but definitely the, the we I, I see a lot of different people from different communities who don't normally talk to one another uh, come together 
Um, a good example of that is uh, one of the center faculty, Joe Grunfest, is a professor in the law school. Um, he's getting heavily into uh, this question of, you know, commodities versus securities, um, which is, you know, it's fascinating, fascinating area of the law. Um, and so it's been, you know, it's been really, really fun um, to kind of learn more about that and, you know, have him be involved in the center. Um, so that's just one example. But even within computer science, um, you know, there are folks who are doing uh, verification. So folks who work primarily on verifying that hardware uh, designs are doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, I'm talking to them now about, well, can't we apply these verification tools to um, smart contracts and consensus protocols? And the answer is yes, we absolutely can do that. Uh, and so I can see already people are starting to shift their research focus um, and start to work on those questions uh, in addition to their traditional work on hardware, on verifying hardware. So, I mean, that's fascinating, right? That's kind of a result of, uh, of blockchain uh, research that just hasn't happened before. Um, and again, there are more, exam more and more examples like this in programming languages, right? I mean, we need, pro we need good programming languages for, um, for writing distributed applications. Uh, and so you see the programming languages community um, uh, coming up to speed in this area and more and more papers appear. So in fact, in the fall, we're gonna be running a workshop on uh, programming languages for smart contracts to just uh, bring the programming languages community uh, on campus and, and kind of discuss uh, those kind of questions. Um, so it's like, it's like extremely, an extremely broad uh, area, which is why uh, we need a center for it, right? To kind of, kind of coordinate the activities on campus. Um, and I have to say, uh, you know, this is, this, the center is kind of to serve the community as a whole. So if anybody, we have a visitor program, you know, if folks want to come uh, uh, and spend time with our researchers, you know, that, that we're open to that as well. Um, so really there's, there's quite a lot going on. In terms of uh, our outreach activities, as I said, we're creating a lot of educational programs um, to help both novices and experts in the field um, learn more. Uh, so we're going to be running uh, workshops for people who just want to learn about blockchains and what they're for. And those are all open to the public. Uh, folks are very welcome to attend. Um, and then we're going to be running research pro research workshops um, as well for people who are more, more advanced. One thing I should uh, mention is uh, we're running the third uh, Stanford Blockchain Conference in January. And the call for papers just went out. So if any of your audience... Uh, members has good ideas that you'd like to present at the conference, you know, please submit them to the conference. Uh, there'll be a program committee that selects the program and we'd, you know, we would love to have your uh, project be presented at our Stanford blockchain conference. Um, yeah, so to learn more about all this, um, you know, please go to the center's website, uh, cbr.stanford.edu. CBR stands for Center for Blockchain Research. So cbr.stanford.edu, you know, please submit uh, papers and ideas to the blockchain conference and uh you know we would love to see you here in january so long answer to, uh, to your question great thank you though and you heard it here audience if you want to submit your papers go there please the, and do the that. show notes for sure so i guess we can kind of turn it a little bit and and talk about some of your like maybe your personal research or you said just this morning there's three problems you want to dive into. So, so obviously, you know, you're actually a quote unquote builder in this space. And so I guess like, what's something more recently that you've looked into that you'd like to kind of discuss or bring up or um, maybe even the newer problems that you want to you do to dive into when it comes to application of blockchain and building these distributed applications. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd, I'd, I'd love to. So, um, uh, pretty much like, as I said, every project that we talk to, we walk away with new research problems to work on. So we love talking to new projects, you know, so please, please come see us. Um, let's see. So um, I, one thing I'd like to mention is um, some recent work that we did on uh, proof systems. This is a proof system called Bulletproofs. Um, it's joint work with my uh, student, Benedict Buenz, and um, uh, the folks from uh, Blockstream, Greg Maxwell, Andrew Palestra, and uh, Peter Woolley. And what bulletproofs lets you do uh, are basically uh, very, very short zero knowledge proofs. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, anything that you need to prove in zero knowledge can be done uh, using these bulletproofs uh, um, and without having to rely on any trusted setup. So, people, when people think about zero knowledge, they uh, often think about snarks and such. Um, and 
uh, you know, the difference between bulletproofs and snarks is that snarks actually require a trusted setup. Uh, bulletproofs can do it without. Um, the downside of bulletproofs compared to snarks is that verifi verifying uh, a bulletproof takes longer than verifying a snark. But in terms of size, uh, bulletproofs are actually quite short. The first application we applied this to is uh, this idea called confidential transactions. Um, so in confidential transactions, uh, basically the amount that's being transferred from payer to payee is, um, remains hidden. So even though the data is on the blockchain, uh, you cannot tell how much, how many Bitcoins, for example, if you're applying it to Bitcoin, were transferred from the payer to the payee. Uh, today, if you look at the Bitcoin blockchain, you can see exactly uh, how much was transferred, which makes basically the Bitcoin blockchain somewhat unfriendly to business, right? If I'm a, let's say, you know, I'm a car manufacturer and I want to buy tires for my supplier, if I wanted to pay them in Bitcoin, everybody would see how much, you know, how much uh, I, I'm paying my supplier for the tires that I'm buying from them, which is sort of what not what businesses want to want to do. So you'd like to keep uh, the amounts public. It, maybe it's okay to reveal that I'm buying tires from a particular su supplier, but uh, the amounts should not be available to the public. And so the question is how to do that. Uh, and so the, the idea is uh, essentially to write commitments to the amounts to the blockchain rather than the amounts in the clear. And then the problem is if since the amounts are not available in the clear, how do you verify that, transa that a transaction is valid? Namely, how do you verify that the sum of the input amounts is equal to the sum of the output amounts? Right? That's what, that's what defines uh, a, a validity of a transaction. But now the amounts are hidden, so how do you do that? And so the idea is to use zero knowledge for this, where essentially we post a zero knowledge proof into the transaction, and then anyone can verify that the transaction is valid without actually knowing what the amounts are. So I hope that's clear. Let me know if I need to go into to explain that more. But I, hope I can. Uh, clear. Let me take a stab at it. So instead of posting the amounts, you just post a proof, and then you can take that proof and then verify that the amounts were there. But it only needs to be proven between the two parties that actually did the transaction. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. So instead of uh, writing the, you know, instead of saying, you know, this transaction is for zero point one bitcoins. Uh, what you would do, or you know, the input is such and the output is such, what you would do is you would actually post uh, commitments to the numbers. Yeah, so mm -hmm. rather than posting the actual numbers, you would post commitments to numbers, um, and then you just need to argue that the sum of the commit committed values and in the input is equal to the sum of the committed value and the output, and any, that all the values are positive. Do you have any problems with induction That's, based on like the, like the, the final transaction fee and the, the disparate amounts of inputs and outputs? Yeah, so the transaction fee itself isn't clear. So, so that can kind of be added into the sum. So technically, you're right. It's the sum of the inputs is equal to the sum of the outputs plus the transaction fee. Um, uh, but now because the inputs are just committed values and the outputs are just committed values, you have to prove that whoever is issuing the transaction has to prove that those two sums are equal and that all the numbers are positive. And what Bulletproof lets you do is they let you do, do these proofs in a, you know, in a very, very succinctly. So the proofs themselves are just a couple of hundreds of bytes, whereas before they were several kilobytes. So this is quite shorter than um, what was possible before. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, is there, so that's kind of the idea behind Bulletproof. Is there a burden that's being placed on the, on, the val on the validators that are trying to perform these proofs, or are they kind of selective proofs based on parties that are interested? Oh, so the validators basically, they look at a transaction, and now the validator basically would have to uh, check that the zero knowledge proof that goes with the transaction is valid, right? That in other words, mm -hmm. you know, the, again, the sum of the inputs is equal to the sum of the outputs plus transaction fee, and that all the outputs are positive. So the validator would have to verify that statement uh, in zero knowledge. So all they learn is that the statement is correct, uh, but they learn nothing else. So they learn nothing about the actual values or amounts that are committed on the blockchain. So the more work, there is a bit more work for the validators to do in the sense that before all they did is you just computed the sums and checked that the two sums are equal. Now they can't compute sums because the values themselves are not written on the blockchain. We only have commitments to values on the blockchains. Uh, so they have to verify the zero knowledge proof, which is more work than just verifying a sum, but not too much more work. And actually, uh, in the paper, we kind of uh, do the performance analysis quite, quite in quite a bit of, of detail. Um, uh, but the point is, 
that that because these these proofs are short, we're actually not uh, expanding the size of the blockchain by too much when we include them. Right, the cost in some sense is you know how many bytes get written to the blockchain, and bulletproofs are designed to be really really short, so that uh, the blockchain does not grow much by adding um, by adding these proofs. Now I'll tell you the amazing thing is um, that bulletproofs can actually be batch ver are batch verifiable. What that means is if you have to verify like 100 bulletproofs at the same time, you can do that much faster than verifying them one by one. So if you're, uh, if you're minting a block uh, and you need to verify, you know, the couple of thousand transactions in that block, you verify them all at the same time, say, if that's what you're doing. That's, that's, not, that's not, not always what happens, but imagine that's what you're doing. Then uh, you can verify these transactions as a, as a batch much faster than verifying them one by one. Um, and in some settings, the amazing thing is that, that verifying the transaction as a batch, the marginal cost of that is really no more than verifying the ECDAC signature associated with the transaction. Yeah. So that um, uh, A, they're short, and B, they're actually not that expensive to verify as a batch. Um, yeah, which is... Which is a, a little bit a little bit uh, surprising. That's really fantastic. So, can these yeah. things can these things work in conjunction with like different signature schemes, like sort, snore signatures and other, you know, planned improvements for the Bitcoin protocol? Ah, okay. So let's switch topics a bit and talk about signatures. Fantastic. <laughs> Glad you brought that up. <laughs> Transition. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good. Um, yeah. So there. So the answer is yes. Uh, and in fact, there are uh, a couple of different types of signature schemes uh, um, being considered for modern blockchains. So of course, Satoshi uh, suggested use or, or actually used ECDSA signatures for the original Bitcoin, and that was adopted by uh, by many other projects. Um, I have to say, ECDSA are uh, fine signatures from a security point of view. But they do have some some problems with them. And for example, if you wanted to do um, a threshold mechanism, so if you wanted to do um, you wanted to distribute the key so that multiple people would be needed uh, in order to generate an ECDAC ECDS signature, they're not that easy to thresholdize. Uh, they're also not that easy to um, uh, do what's called distributed key generation uh, for them. And so. Um, uh, Schnorr signatures, uh, oh, uh, sorry, then the last thing is um, uh, they're not that easy to aggregate. So aggregate means, aggregating a signature means that if you have uh, multiple signatures, sorry, if you have multiple signed messages, uh, you would like to actually uh, combine all the signatures on those messages into one short, succinct signature. Yeah, so for example, maybe I have 10 messages that are signed by 10 different people, it'd be kind of nice if I can take those 10 signatures and compress them into a single signature that would authenticate all 10 messages. With ECDSA, that's actually uh, somewhat difficult to do. Um, with Schnorr signatures, this is easier to do, but interestingly, it requires uh, a protocol between the signers, yeah? So you can aggregate Schnorr signatures um, into a shorter signature, but that requires actually some interaction between, uh, between the signers. Um, uh, yeah, and in fact, there's actually beautiful work out of Blockstream that shows, that shows uh, how to do that for Schnorr signatures. So one thing that we've been working on is um, another type of signatures that, that's very applicable to the blockchain. These are called BLS signatures. Um, so BLS signatures are based on slightly different math than Schnorr signatures. They're based on what are called uh, pairings. Um, so for example, um, Zcash uses, mm -hmm. uses pairings for their, for their snarks. So anyone who uses snarks uh, today typically uses, um, uses pairings. Uh, and these pairings can also be used to derive very efficient or very uh, uh, or properties, sorry, signatures with, with interesting properties. These are called BLS signatures. Um, and what they provide is a mechanism, is a way for uh, aggregating signatures very, very easily. So uh, imagine you have a block of transactions and each transaction has um, a signature by a different signer on it. Interestingly, with BLS signatures, you can actually take all those signatures. Uh, and in fact, anyone can compress all those signatures into a single signature. Yeah. So let me say that again. So. If you have a block of say a thousand transactions, um, and uh, normally you would have to keep like you know at a minimum a thousand signatures, one signature mm -hmm. say uh, per transaction. Uh, with BLS signatures, what you can do is you can take those 
thousand signatures, you know, one signature per, per transaction, and aggregate all those signatures into a single signature that can then be posted on the block. Yeah, if that's what you wanted to do. And in hmm. fact, anyone can do it. These signatures are publicly aggregatable. Uh, yeah, so it's just a very, just a basic multiplication. You take all the signatures that you had and you just multiply them all together. <laughs> that's it. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that one simple signature can then authenticate the entire block. And like, if for, that, I guess to, to, to bring that back to high level, what this is doing is incre incredibly increasing the efficiency of how much we can fit into a blockchain while not compromising on any of the security features that we currently have. Is that a good, I guess maybe, I mean, there's a lot of other th cool things that we can do in terms of like cryptographic systems and sending messages from a group of people to another group of people. But I think, would you say the majority of the push for this types of research is increasing the efficiency of putting data in a blockchain? That's exactly right. Yes, that, that is what you said. That's exactly a, a great way to describe it. You can basically, um, because you're not spending so much space on signatures, you can put more transactions into a block without increasing the size of the block. Yeah, that's, exa that's exactly right. Okay, I just wanted to kind of like put um, a high level, high level cap because some of our audience won't be able to follow some of that. And I want to make sure that they get the reason for the development of these types of things. And it's, it's important to note that you're not compromising on any of the actual underlying principles of like why people got into blockchain in the first place. This is just brand new cryptography that allows for efficiency gains. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you. That's exactly, that's exactly the way to say it. <laughs> um, Right. Um, good. I mean, I, I, so I'm happy to discuss these uh, th these more, but um, um... Mm -hmm. I guess the toughest part seems like this is all open source. It seems so. I guess it's always. I guess I'll be the Debbie Downer. It always sucks if you do all this great research and make these advancements, but the open source community just doesn't grab a hold of it. And that's something that that's something that I've like been delicately fearful of for the past three years in this industry is because I feel like there's a lot of advancements that are made and people like yourself doing amazing research, but it may not be hitting the echo chambers of Twitter or wherever these messages need to be heard um, for, you know, it to, to, to be adopted. So that's not really a question. I'll yeah. just talk. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that, bringing that up. That, that's a really good, that's a really good point. So, by the way, I have to say most of the work that we do is uh, is all open source available. So, Bulletproof is a, there's an open source implementation on the Bulletproof website for BLS signatures. Uh, there are a lot of open source libraries that implement uh, Bulletproof uh, BLS signatures. Um, yeah, Definity, for example, they they put out uh, a BLS signature library that's actually really really good. So, if anybody wants to use BLS signatures, you know, check out the Definity implementation. Oh yeah. Um, uh, I, I guess um, I guess uh, when it comes to deployment of open source idea, let me let me share with you the one frustration that I had, um, which is uh, some work that we did a while ago uh, on what are called uh, proofs of proofs of solvency. Um, so what is a what is a proof of solvency? Well, it's basically a way for an exchange uh, to prove that it's uh, solvent. Yeah. So what does that mean? Um, so think back to the days of Mt. Gox, right? So with Mt. Gox, uh, people gave them their, uh, their their coins, and then basically the coins were were lost. Yeah, to put it to put it simply. Um, mm -hmm. And so the exchange basically became non-solvent, but nobody knew that until it was too late. So what would be really cool is if there's a way for an exchange to, you know. Because they collect, you know, coins from folks, it would be really nice if there was a way for the exchange to prove that it still has enough assets to cover all of its obligations. So it has obligations to each one of its customers, and it has corresponding assets on the blockchain to cover those obligations. So what a proof of solvency does is basically proves that the sum of the obligations is uh, less than or equal to the sum of the assets. Right? Make sense? That's a proof yeah. of solvency. <laughs> And by the way, I guess there's a more there's a generalization of proof of solvency called a, called a proof of reserve, where instead of proving that the obligations are less or than or equal to the assets, you prove that um, you know you have like a 10% reserve. So technically, that would mean that uh, the sum of the obligations is less than or equal to um, you know half the uh, what is it half the assets or yeah so. some fraction of yes. the assets. So so 
uh, or less than or equal to twice the assets or uh, uh, however it is. Yeah, fraction, exactly. Fractional reserves. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the problem with proofs of solvency is how do you do them, right? So well, how does a bank prove that it's solvent? Well, you know, they bring in external auditors and the auditors look at the books and then they, they sign off, say, yes, this bank is solvent or this bank is not solvent. Uh, and you can, so it's a very expensive process. You can only do it once a year. It's a, it's a very manual, manually driven process um, and so on. Um, the beauty of, the, of crypto, crypto assets is that you can actually do this all using crypto, right? Which is, which is uh, kind of cool. And it also means that you can run it on a daily basis as an automatic process. You can imagine an exchange that like literally every day publishes a proof of solvency to say, yes, we're solvent. We can cover all of our obligation obligations or a fraction of our obligations depending on the on the needs the problem is um the kind of the technical uh, challenge for us was how do you do it without actually revealing what the obligations are to the public or revealing the assets to the public right the last thing an exchange would want to do is 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 uh, reveal to the world how many customers it has and exactly which ask which how, what are the obligations to each one of its customers are those are kind of business sensitive data well, so enter uh, zero knowledge one more time. And what we can do is we can have the uh, exchange prove in zero knowledge that the, you know, the sum of all of its obligations are greater than or equal to, say, the, uh, the sum of all of its uh, assets without revealing what the obligations are and without revealing what the assets are. Yeah, so there's really no mm -hmm. loss in privacy for proving that these, uh, these exchanges are solvent. Uh, so the question then is, uh, how long does it take to generate the proofs, and how big are these proofs, and how long does it take to verify them? Well, so here's where bulletproofs are useful again. So with bulletproofs, we can actually give uh, a proof of solvency for a large exchange, an exchange that has several mil million users, and the proof of solvency, its size is only a few megabytes. That's it. Yeah, so essentially, a large exchange with a couple of million users, all we're asking you to do is every day, you know, publish a few megabytes, and that's your proof of solvency. And then anyone can go and check that uh, the exchange is still solvent. Yeah, so, mm. and, and, and there's no reason why you can't do that uh, publicly. I have a question. Um, this. Um, yeah, please. I feel like there's, there's an assumption that um, the exchange keeps all of its assets on a blockchain as opposed to, like, I guess the naive implementation of, a, of, a, of an exchange is have a cold cold wallet, have a hot wallet, and an SQL database that maps addresses to amounts in which you keep track of. That would be the naive, efficient way of doing things so that they can handle scale while not actually uh, like processing thousands, thousands, thousands of transactions unless someone wants to preserve, the, take out their money. Does the bulletproof require that all of these things be kind of on a blockchain for it to then map um, obligations to how much money they actually have. Ah, that's a that's an excellent question. So I, I think what you're asking is, uh, as you said, they have a hot wallet and a cold wallet. Uh, to do the proof of obligation, do they have to kind of touch the assets in the cold wallet, which they don't want to do, right? They don't typically they don't touch the cold wallet on a daily basis. Is that did I understand the question correctly? Or more like the like the mapping between because like more often than not, the accounts and the balances of those accounts are just in like an SQL database. Does that kind of off blockchain record keeping have a problem with bulletproofs or not? Is it just... uh, no, that actually, so these would be the proofs of solvency. Yeah. So okay. bulletproofs would be the way we implement the proof of solvency. Because that's just, uh, that, that can basically just be, be, be faked, right? That type of thing can yeah, be faked. Yeah. So that, so that actually the SQL database is, is basically what's, what would be used to construct the proof of solvency. But, but this question of a hot wallet versus cold, cold wallet is a really good one in that. How do you do a proof of solvency? without touching the actual uh, keys. Uh, so to do that, basically what we, what we um, uh, propose is, is what, what we call uh, valet keys. Yeah, so a valet key is something that lets you prove that you own um, a particular asset, crypto assets, without actually being able to spend it. Yeah, so it's a, it's a way to prove ownership without actually being able to, uh, to spend those funds. So you can keep your, um, you know, all your assets in a cold wallet that's perfectly fine. You don't have to touch the, um, those, uh, those assets. Uh, you keep your, your um, valet keys that let you prove possession but not be able to spend. You keep those uh, outside of the wallet and you use those for the proof of solvency. Yeah, that's, that's kind of uh, how, that, how, how that would work. Um, yeah, so it's a, you know, it's a fascinating, fascinating, fascinating area. Uh, lots of technical uh, questions to deal with there. 
again, I'd be happy to uh, to discuss this more with anyone who's interested in implementing it. Maybe I can talk a little bit about our deployment efforts there. Yeah, please so, do. Uh, we, yeah. <laughs> so we, we, we talked to a, a number of exchanges and, you know, everybody's very interested in a proof of, in doing these proofs of solvency, but um, I guess, you know, they have a million features that they need to implement. And so it's just a matter of priority. Where, where do you, where do you um, put the proof of solvency in the priority list? And so far, so far, no one has really stepped up uh, to put it on a high enough, as a high enough priority to actually uh, be implemented. So we're kind of still waiting for uh, some exchange to um, adopt this and actually be the first one to actually deploy an online proof of solvency. I think once one exchange does it, the market would kind of have to, um, uh, you know, to, uh, to um, um, adjust and everyone would have to, and, and many other exchanges would have to do it. It would probably make, you know, would give more confidence in, in, in the exchanges. And so probably a good thing to do, uh, but somebody has to step, step up to be the first one to deploy this. And so, you know, again, if your listeners are interested in uh, being the guinea pigs, then, uh, maybe guinea pig is not the, the best word best word to describe it, but if someone's interested <laughs> in the first one in deploying something like this, you know, they would have a significant market advantage, it seems. Um, and so, you know, again, we'd be happy to 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 help uh, with whatever technical questions come up. I have another technical um, question that I think any exchange would obviously have, and that is, um, is there a risk associated with, de with, with deploying this in terms of like, do they need to move all of their cash, say, from their cold wallet to a different cold wallet that enabled these types of these valet keys, or is it something you can derive from the previous keys? Ah, um, yeah. So that, that's something that I guess is specific to how the cold storage is implemented. So I guess the, there's no generic, there's no, I wish I could give you a generic answer, okay. but now we're getting into like implementation details yeah. that uh, would be probably different for every, for every exchange. I would just um, assume that yeah, most exchanges those, those... are reluctant to move money if, to move money if they don't have to, right? So like the, the, the vast storage is, you know, seft, like kept in safekeeping and they want to minimize access to that type of stuff. So a lot of the improvements they make is stuff that doesn't involve that money. And this type of improvement may or may not involve that money, which then I guess maybe knocks it down on the priority list. And so them knowing whether or not they can do that would then give them a, if they don't have to move it, they can derive these keys from previous keys without having to move that money there's less risk associated with that type of thing, which means they're may more mm -hmm. maybe more likely to do it. And they were just ignorant of the fact that they could do it that way. Yeah. So that, that's a good, that's, that's a good question. So in principle, you could do it without, so you're asking whether you actually have to issue a transaction in order to generate a valet key. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer to that is uh, potentially no. Um, but again, it would depend on the specific uh, implementation. Course. There's no, there's no fundamental reason why you would have to issue a transaction, uh, but it would depend on the specific implementation. Yeah. Um, I have to say, this is kind of why this research is so is so fascinating. If like anybody wanted to to discuss how to de deploy uh, proof of solvencies, I'm sure you know. I'm sure there'll be new research questions that come out of just actually trying to get it to work in practice, which would again for us is fascinating. This is this is why I love the space. You know, everything everything we you, you we try to actually uh, use in the real world generates more questions to think about. Um, which is which is why this is so much fun. Absolutely. I guess my only question is, it seems like exchanges would be bending over backwards to get that market advantage, but um, maybe not. I mean, obviously not. So, um, but if you are working for an exchange and you heard it, please reach out because that'd be neat. I'd love to know that yeah, an exchange user. that I was sending money to was solvent. <laughs> that would be an awesome thing to know. So, well, there's an do, aspect do you have yeah. time or... Go ahead. Go ahead, Corey. There's an aspect of this entire space that's difficult for anybody building something, especially building something that holds people's money. And that um, the like the increase, the expansion of the people running into the space makes them put out fires more often than implement new things. And in, because new things are often novel cryptography, they're reluctant to do so because it hasn't been vetted well enough. And especially when you're holding a bunch of other people's money, you have a lot of reluctance to do so. And so I think over time or as new people come into the space who aren't holding as much money, they'd be willing to have that market advantage to then do something like that. Mm. I hope so. It's but, but you know, in, re realistically also, they have, they really have thousands of features they need to implement. And it yeah. really is um, a matter of prioritizing. Um, There's so, so much cool stuff. Hopefully the market <laughs> advantage will convince people to prioritize this higher. Yeah. That to me seems like it would put it up on the old list, but uh <laughs> I don't know. I don't work in the inside of exchange. So, um, I don't know. Do we have enough time or should we wrap it up? Corey, what do you think? 
Oh, that's up. That's up to Dan here. I, I, I could go for ever talking about this type of stuff. This is my, it's my wheelhouse. Do you, do you have um, some time or should we should probably wrap it up? Right. Yeah, probably. probably. Yeah. Okay. I gave you let's go ahead and wrap it up. <laughs> let's go ahead. And wrap yeah. It up. Let's, um, we'll wrap it up. You know, obviously open invitation back. Um, um, uh, the center for blockchain research is something that, you know, is definitely going to be on my radar. Um, because we need more of them, and I'm surprised there aren't more. And uh, I got really interested when I saw this one, when I saw this one pop up. So thank you for your work there, uh, Dr. Bonet. Uh, we have one last question. Um, in 10 words or less, can you describe blockchain? Oh, boy. Ha. Uh, 10 words or less, huh? I know scientists are not uh, known for being succinct, but we're going to ask you to be. <laughs> Okay, okay. Well, um, it's basically a way to keep data so that um, everyone agrees on what uh, the data is, and no one can prevent you from uh, adding, um, adding um, more elements to that data. I don't know. Okay. Uh, Certainly quick, over quick 10 words. It. Certainly over Around 10 words. 27. <laughs> Around oh, no. 27, but uh, oh. it's still a very, very good definition. Um, there's no life well, penalty. Consen con consensus and liveness. Those are the main properties, right? Consensus and liveness. Yeah. Consensus Absolutely. and liveness. Okay. We can <laughs> paraphrase. We'll paraphrase that. Um, uh, well, thank you for, for swinging by today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, once yeah, again, thank, thank you, you very much, work. guys. This was a lot of fun. Hope yeah. I didn't and, go into uh, too, too, too much of the, of the weeds. Never. Definitely. I think it's a, it's, it's a great, uh, you got just deep enough. And that's that's good, good for everyone. So you're definitely awesome. welcome back anytime. If you if you like hit a stride with any of these problems that you're doing research on, and you want to tell the world, please come to us first, and uh, we can discuss what you've been working on. So, awesome. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. And that was the interview with Dr. Dan Bonet. It sounds like a '90s like a 90s uh boy band last name no like like he's the guy in the band that's like yeah girl and i just want to tell you that i made this apple pie with love and i bring it to your apartment with love and it's still warm like our love like the guy with the deep voice that talks in the background you know mr bonet mm -hmm. that's a yeah or the single artist with the falsetto that like sings to, sings about watching you in the mall. It's, it's creepy, but because he has a falsetto voice and it's kind of nice, like the girls are okay with it. Like, I've been watching you while you walk. And the girls are like, oh, I love it. Yeah. It's so nice. Yeah. I love Bonet. There is a musician named Bonet. Bonetmusic.com. <laughs> I told you, I knew it. <laughs> it's such a musician name. He's a uh, he's a worship leader at a Jewish synagogue, and he wrote. I didn't a, expect it to go there. I did. He wrote a ten song <laughs> album. A worship album. Oh, I bet oh, it's riveting. That's definitely opposite of what I thought. I thought track, he would be trying to uh, talk to women. Track six is called You Clothe Me. Bonet, the remix god. That's what it is. Anyway, um, topics so, of conversation uh, today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I think is interesting um, is ever since I started just the headers, it, one, it's starting to get a little deja vu because the articles don't change their tone. And there's not really interesting stuff that the mainstream news cares about. So I'm going to try to add some more stuff to the RSS feeds that come in um, just because it seems like price or regulators say this or regulators say that. Regulators don't say this or they don't say that. Um, but the thing that I worry about, right, is, or not worry about, but if that's all the mainstream news is covering, then that's pretty much all retail investors ever get to see. So I'm just, I'm wondering if, like, is it by design that it's just such crappy news about things that are kind of lame or... Like, is it just lazy journalism? I tried to get a journalist on the show, but it was like going through the labyrinth to get that person on the show. Um, but 
I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you guys even read the mainstream news or do you do you try and get your uh, updates on this industry, uh, other, other other avenues? I will peruse headlines, but I never really read them because they're too service level. Like it's just like it's hard to it's hard mm-hmm. to figure out. Like say for instance, I'm reading I'm on, you know, coindesk.com. It's hard to see what of the you know twenty articles a day they put out or more. I don't know their 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 volume, but which one of those is actually impactful and which one is just like fluff. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to waste my time trying to figure that out. I'd rather um, trust the group of people that I follow to discuss things that are important. I've spent a lot of time curating a community to follow so that the things that they talk about and the communities that I'm involved with will bring up issues that I need to know about. And I can, I can then use that as a springboard to go learn more. Mm-hmm. I think, about uh, you too? I think headlines are just, they're only manufactured to manipulate price and manipulate investors. So, I mean, I go on, I go on Twitter to get all my news. Like for instance, Brian Armstrong, uh, will tweet that uh, Facebook has whitelisted his ads so Coinbase can run ads on Facebook again. Hooray. I don't need to go to Coindesk to hear that. I can just hear it straight from the CEO of that company. And I can tailor my feed to get the news I want. So I think I made a joke in Slack the other day instead of just the headers or in addition to just the headers, we have like a crypto headline show where we just peruse crypto Twitter and pull the best headlines from Twitter. I mean, that's very possible. But that could, that could also just be added to just the headers. But at the yeah. same time, that's dangerous. Why? You don't want to get news from the source. You want to get it from a third party because that's what history's taught us about news. I mean, but when when you get news filtered through like PR firms and all that, you're going to run into the same problems you're running into. The same news from the same RS feeds. Yeah, but not all of it is PRs. I mean, you've got to trust the i mean it's kind of like an unwritten thing about getting news is you trust where it's coming from and you i mean i wouldn't trust the source because brian armstrong could say anything about like he could say like anything at all about yeah we went to the headquarters of facebook and i talked to zuckerberg himself and he stroked my goatee even though it's immature and now we are back on facebook like that's the whole problem with trump right that's the whole He's he's got his own media source, and that that's supposed to be illegal. But he's on Twitter tweeting out all this fake shit, and people love it. So like that's 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 why you don't get it from the source. I mean, it's it's a it's a judgment call, right? Like you you should always we talked about this before. Whenever you're reading something that someone's putting out, you have to take into account the source and their reason for posting it. Like what are they getting out of it? And you have to then judge the quality of the material in the post with that motivation and and of the source and you know their, their I guess their their past right. So you try and pick things that give you reasonably good information mm. and follow that group of things. And it still it's still biased. Everything's biased. Like there's no I don't yeah. think there's such a thing as good cryptocurrency journalism. Like objective big J journalism. I don't think that exists. So you have to mm-hmm. read everything that you see with a lens of why they're posting it and the motivation behind it. And you have to make your own judgment on what do they stand to gain? Like, I don't believe anything Ver says because he has a history of saying things that aren't true to then benefit himself. Mm-hmm. But if he says things, I'm going to look like, and that, that may catch my eye. I'll look for that topic in the objective places I know to go to find out more about it. But I'm not going to take his word. He may be a springboard for me to find out more of things that may interest me. Well, you can use a real world example. When when McAfee said that his wallet was the be all end all, you're like, why don't you send it to me? And I'll, I'll try to back up that statement. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the way I live my life though. Right. I, like, I don't, I don't like, I don't I subscribe to a group that informs my judgments. I, I come to my own conclusions based on things I know to be true or feel to be true. And then that may align with some ideology by happenstance. 
And mm. it's the, when you go the opposite is when you get like tribalism and a lot of ignorance and people who just say things because that's what the group they belong to says. And I yeah, think it's just, it's, just, it's a safer, it's a safer way to live, to come to your own decisions based on your own logic and intellect. Yep. There was a solid two to three years of my life where if something said it was the best ever, I always tested that out. Cause I was like, what if it is the best? Yeah, you did. You did every time you were, you were the demographic of all marketers. Cause they just said a few words are like mm, sold. Gotta go check that out. This is the best action movie you'll ever see. See. And I'd say like, what if they're right? I should go check this movie out just in case I don't want to miss it. If it's the best. I can't miss that. I, I, I do want to like backpedal on what you said. Like we tried to get a journalist on, I'm not going to name names or name the publications. Uh, but they wanted to like, oh, can we get a list of questions so I can run it by and all this? And, all, and they emailed us and I'm just like, why can't you just come on as a person? And why does it have to be tied to your employer or tied to the place you work? And I just didn't understand that. I mean, we, we've talked over 200 guests. We've never had to jump through that many hoops. Just come on as yourself. Talk be objectively. Go be a human. Be a human. But no, like, it, oh, you know, I need a list of questions and... You know, I need, I need background to check and package. I need you to start an account here and get the NDA. And it's like, dude, come, just yeah, fuck out of here. So well, that's not what our show's about, right? Like, yeah. I well, think... I, I was transparent. I said, hey, look, the more you prepare for the interview, the worse it'll be. I'm sorry, that's just the yeah. way the show is run. So, yep. Um, that's all I have for you guys. So, I guess as our audience, if you're listening to this, um when you're out there reading the news and stuff, dig a little bit deeper than what they give you. Um, you know, it's 2018. You can always dig deep enough to find something that's that public um, or hopefully. Um, but a lot of this like news that I see coming out of the mainstreams, when I say mainstream, as I'm talking Coindesk, Cointelegraph, Bitcoin.com. Um, what's that one that's like all over the top and read it all the time is it ccn or whatever uh we, those guys should we talk uh, about that ccn thing or no nope uh, let's not, no, we're, let's we're, not we're working that. on letting that play out from the back end yeah. before we start talking about it yeah um i mean that's all i really had to discuss today i was just not worried but i just noticed a trend and i just wanted to talk about like oh the news kind of talks about the same stuff every week are they like programming us I don't yeah know. but like that in that it's kind of obvious, right? It, it, who's the demographic that the RSS feeds that you subscribe to are for? Uh, the people who typically look at those those publications, are they in-depth developers who understand like, subtleties of the infrastructure? Are they investors? Are they people trying to learn how this stuff is working? Who are they? And GPPs, baby. Oh, then, of course. That, what, what type of publication can you put out regularly that will be um, interesting to that audience? It can't. The it price can't, is going to go up. It can't cover too much material. Yeah, that's right. If someone took a week in Ethereum and built out a technical, high-level hashing it out website where it had like no ulterior motives, only high-level headlines about progress in the community, there's not one out like that. By the way, so if anybody who's not lazy wants to do uh, that, I don't, give me five percent yeah. of your profit. If there is, please let us know. We'd love to be. Yeah. We'd love to like watch it because the 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 amount of quality curated material coming from weekend ethereum from evan is fantastic like i can tell that there's well, a lot of work that goes into it top john there. yeah he's doing good yeah. but it's not it's not at the level of of the amount of work going into that that newsletter john he's yeah. doing good but he's not it's not there yet like i'm happy he's a part of it i'm happy we have one yeah but i will not know the if I call level it, of detail it's, it's of curated contribution to the publication yeah yeah, I would say like a real website where you can go get high level news and all that. Well, that takes a um, team, right? You need like people to do all that type of stuff. It's it's teamwork it, makes the dream work. Oh, it's shit. easy for one person to make a newsletter because there isn't a lot of like peripheral development slash administration, whatever. Like none of not one of us could have done this podcast and everything around it. It took all three right. of us to do it. Mm -hmm. yep. I would love to see a tag team between uh Vitalik Armstrong and Rihanna. I'd love Hold to see on. what that looks like. 
A sexual tag team? Yeah. No, no. That's what it Come came on, out. Man. It came out that way. That's what it sounded yeah, like. That's that's where my really? brain went. Yeah. What what are you think talking it about? That way then? at all. We were talking about teamwork, making the dream work, and you were talking about like different people bringing different stuff to the table. And I was like, man, I wonder if those three forty under forty people that we talked about to keep the thread of continuity going. Um, but I you guys we'll, took it sexual. I think we'll and that shows your you guys the level of maturity. So we're done, um, we're done here. I mean, yeah, we have to be done now because you guys just offended everyone. So uh, let's let's wrap this up. Um, I just know some chilla. What? Why do you have an Oakley case? Like for Oakleys? Do you wear that many Oakleys? No, it's it's a case for. Uh other stuff it's i'm just gonna take the branding off of it oh okay work in progress your office is way cooler than mine i'm looking at it and mine is whack compared to yours well he's anyways been building um, for a while. what do we do so the first thing we do if you go to the bitcoin network it'll take you to the bitcoin podcast.com um, you could peruse all the things on the site. Uh, it's mostly just a site to get you to go to the different podcasts that the network offers. You can click on the podcast tab and it'll break down all the podcasts that are, are, are uh, on the network and, and producing content. Um, check them all out. We have a music broadcast. We have a broadcast specifically for, uh, you know, like projects that cause social impact. Um, there's, a uh, Podcasts for the headlines. There's podcasts for deep technical dives that you don't get anywhere else. Hashing it out is in a league of its own. Corey, do you feel good about that? Being in a league of your own? I'm enjoying doing it. Yeah, I mean, it's so true. A league of, like, uh, do you feel like uh, the movie, A League of Their Own? No. I wouldn't think you would. Uh, <laughs> what, else? what else do we do? Uh, you can join the Slack if you if you go to the Bitcoin Podcast dot network. Um, we're in there. Uh, one of the recent Slack members said, "I have to give you guys credit because you guys have been doing this for like two, three years strong." Uh, the Slack is two years old, I think. The Slack is two years old. Yeah, he said, and you guys are always in here, dedicating your time every day. If anybody has a question, if anybody just wants to shoot the shit, you're here. Other crypto groups fade, and you know why they fade? Because they only give a shit about the price. Um, speaking of which, how about that price? Uh, but <laughs> let's not talk about that. Um, the, yeah, join the Slack. There's lots of people to talk to, lots of professionals in there too. So um, it's a great oh, environment. You just reminded me, speaking of price, I sold all my Tron. So no more Tron jokes. All right. No more bag holding. You sold all your Tron? Sold it all. Wow. What happened? You lost faith? No, I doubled my money and got tired of waiting. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. That's inv <laughs> more investment advice from Cello. How to double your money. You get tired of waiting and, and just sell when you doubled your money. It's not a bad. Not, not investment bad advice, but I'm I'm not bag holding anymore. I'm just gonna I consolidate everything into the big three, except for the, you know the the majors. What would you not consider the big three? Oh, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin. Okay. Uh, as long as uh, Bitcoin controls the market and all that, I mean, what's the point? I mean, when Bitcoin goes up, my bags go up. So just what's the point? Yeah, that's what a lot of people are doing, but not saying that they're doing. That's why I like each other. You keep it real. You keep it real out in these streets. Sure. Just don't uh, sue me. Uh, <laughs> all right. We're done here. Oh, no, no, no. The Bitcoin uh, medium.com slash the Bitcoin podcast. That's our blog. Uh, it's really a publication that we'd hope that you'd love to contribute to. Um, we have one contributor, Mr. Thompson. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for destroying your name last week. Um, if you'd like to contribute things, please, please hit us up in our Slack by joining the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Um, what else do we do? I think that's about it. We're done yeah, here. That's about it. Huh? We're done here. Yeah. Oh, I hear babies. It's We're going to wrap go. it up. So uh, thank you guys for watching this live stream. We, we're live. We're, we're going to try and get in a good habit of live streaming the round table. So if you were asking questions, we were ignoring you. And I told you that. We'll get better at so, it. So, oh, yeah. uh, 
Crypto Until Infinity, DJ Neverending Story, is going to start releasing some video content. And he just released episode 17 with his first interview with the A&R of Tune. All right. Good shit, man. We'll, we keep it coming for you guys. Um, well, that's it. Uh, shout out to Zoe Saldana and Carrie Hilson and Zazie Beats. Um, he, uh, wait, what did I say? Play the outro.